All right. I think we can get started. Dr. Bassi, you ready to get started? I am. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, for those of you that uh, may not know me or we haven't had the opportunity to meet, my name is Robert Trevieso. Um, this year, I am the chair of the Solo Small Firm Committee with the Jacksonville Bar Association. Um, one of the things that I wanted to do um, this year is to have have some have some CLE opportunities for the solo small lawyers um, that I, I hope are relevant or pertinent to um, lawyers in general. But also, I think with the with the stresses of working in a smaller practice um, or the unique um, uh, stresses, I think that that are um, relevant to the smaller practitioner. Um, I wanted to take this opportunity to focus on what I think is, is I mean, it's certainly popular, um, a popular topic, but to focus on mental health, I think it's still something that should be um, for in the forefront of all of our minds, because I think we're in a high stress profession. Um, and so we should be aware of some of these uh, mental health concerns. Um, we, I want to thank Dr. Bassey um, for uh, giving us his time today, um, volunteering his time to help us uh, and guide us through some of these concerns. Uh, Dr. Bassey, I'll let him explain his background in more detail, but Dr. Bassey is the medical director and founder of Telepsych Health, which is uh, the provider of online um, um, psychiatric um, services, psychiatric, psychiatric treatment services. He also has a presence locally um, for in-person treatment, but he started his practice um, virtually, which I find to be pretty fascinating um, and I think is a great benefit to have um, in a, a profession like the legal profession, where a lot of us are constantly on the road, in and out of the office, and frankly, um, you know, would find it very easy to say, I'm too busy, I can't leave the office, um, or, you know, I, I don't have time to, to leave the house and go to an appointment and then come back and all this commuting. Um, this makes it much easier for people to, to obtain treatment. You can find a, a, a closed office or a private office or go into your car. It doesn't really matter as long as you have a good connection and, and a video camera. So I think it's something that is a pretty unique and, and cool opportunity uh, that, is, that, is, that is good for lawyers. So I'll let Dr. Basti uh, explain a little bit further. He knows, he knows you, this Mark. stuff in and out. He's double board <laughs> certified. Yes. He's board certified in, in general psychiatry as well as, well as uh, addiction psychiatry. So he certainly knows this stuff in and out. Um, I will let him explain further. So without further ado, uh, thank you, Dr. Bassey, again. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And I appreciate being here. And it's really nice to meet you all. Hopefully I have the opportunity to meet you all in person. One day, like Robert said, I am local here in the Mandarin area. I have this, op I open this office. It's a very small office, but it's very nice for us and we are primarily virtual however but this is local in mandarin so it's really nice to have a local presentation to all you folks and this is my fir very first presentation to lawyers and i jumped on the opportunity um i just think it's a pretty cool uh opportunity to to talk to everybody about what i know in in medicine and psychiatry and Obviously, I, we have a lot of patients who are lawyers and, and some judges and, and whatnot. And one of our employees, actually, was a former lawyer, Mike Mahoney, and he's very open about that. And he, he was a lawyer, trial lawyer, then um, transferred to being a therapist. So we have two therapists, and the rest of us are medication management individuals. And um, so we'll talk about treatment overview and, and all that good stuff. So like you said, I'm double board certified. I, I did my master's degree in biomedical engineering. I really enjoy technology and the field of mental health. And in fact, I um, started a little passion project of myself or for myself, a uh, podcast uh, interviewing innovators and engineers in the fields. Um, I always kind of felt like I was on the periphery of those conversations when at national conferences. And now this is a way for me to kind of jump in and do something fun. And it's, I feel very privileged and lucky. It doesn't even feel like work to me. It's just a very enjoyable topic to talk about. Um, if you f want to add me or follow me or subscribe, I'd appreciate it. Uh, obviously, you don't have to, um, but I, you know, trying to get my name out there a little bit more with the podcast and and those sorts of things. Um, no disclosures, really, per se. I'm the 100% owner of the private practice Telepsych Health, medical advisor, blogger for the our EHR company called Charm, and no other conflict of interest. So, you know, when I was asked to give the presentation, I it was kind of a blank slate. I didn't really know what I wanted to say. So I think 
trying to cover the most ground to individuals who maybe are on the fence about seeking treatment. What do I want to tell that person who is probably out there because the majority of people who have mental illness actually don't seek treatment. So I thought that this was a cool chance to, to um, talk to that audience um, rather than the typical audience, which I see as patients who are already seeking treatment. So wanted to tell people what I consider early warning signs for, um, for you to start to seek treatment, depression, anxiety, substance use. Obviously, there's other mental illness out there, but the main most common ones address a little bit of stigma since obviously that's a, a big part of um, a professional seeking help. Identify negative consequences for not seeking treatment, some of which are obvious, and uh, compare various types of treatment out there. Find, talk about ways to find a clinician and what to expect. So this is a very widely cited study that came out in 2016 that um, painted a fairly grim picture, alarming picture, um, and let people know that mental illness in the field of law is very common, and it raised a lot of awareness that it needs to be addressed. So they came up with um, a, a survey of 12,000 attorneys by P. Krill and found that the, the rates of depression, anxiety, high stress were very high. It took these graphics on the bottom there from the Florida Bar Association, um, which seemed like was from this study. So the numbers were pretty much right on point there. Um, about one out of five screened positive for hazardous, harmful, or potentially alcohol-dependent drinking. And while creating professional programs is important, the vast majority of lawyers seek treatment paths that are, that are typical of the general population. Only 6.8% actually um, seek drug and alcohol treatment programs that are specifically tailored to legal professionals. So as a result of that study, there's um, a lot of um, eye-capturing headlines that were out, um, various articles. I, I did a Google search in preparation for this presentation. I started typing in our lawyers, dot, dot, dot. Um, I thought this was a little kind of comical aside to this presentation. Um, some of the most common questions are, our lawyers, doctors, are lawyers disappearing? I don't know what that one's about. I don't know, has it, there been a, a rash of kidnappings or something, or maybe the Maybe they're implying the population's declining or not as many people are going into the field. Um, so are lawyers unhappy? You know, this is like, they're very eye-capturing, but um, it helps to raise awareness with respect to burnout. And I think medicine was also uh, accustomed to these types of headlines too. And I think it had this this very large shift towards awareness within residency and afterwards for recognizing burnout, what to do about it and how to revamp some professional programs to address burnout. And then there was a, um, a review by Lair List Token from Yale, and he found that mental health is actually on par with other individuals of the general population who have a bachelor's or higher. So he stated, stated that conventional wisdom rests on a weak empirical foundation, basically a non-random sample wherein um, the people who are doing those or completing those surveys were individuals who are more prone to mental illness. Maybe they wanted to get their voice heard. So what um, Mr. List Token had sought to do was essentially do an analysis of a completely random sample. And they looked at the National Health Interview Survey um, conducted by the U.S. Census Bureau, 35,000 individual or households and 90,000 individuals. And lawyers only comprised less than 1% of the, that population. They found when you compare serious mental illness to other individuals who have a bachelor's or higher, it's basically a, around the same um, fraction there. And But when you look at excess drinking, it is higher. And excess drinking was defined as more than five drinks in a particular day, more than 12 days of the year. So five drinks or more. And that happens at least 12 days of the year. And that was considered to be excess drinking. And that is that is higher than other professionals. So that kind of a little bit framed um, what way I was going to give this presentation and, and want to talk a little bit more about you know alcohol and how to recognize problematic alcohol too. So <clears throat> then wrapping up the the conclusions by that very comprehensive study by Liz Token, um, lawyer mental health is actually much better than the mental health in the general population. Um, but overall, it has continued to worsen over the last 15 years at a rate comparable to the general decline. Some subgroups in the profession suffer mental health at higher rates, in particular women, 
and younger lawyers report more struggles with mental illness than their peers. And basically, one line that I liked in here was that reforms should not take as their starting point that the problems with the profession itself. Um, so, but nonetheless, it's very stressful. And in prepar preparing for this presentation, I asked uh, some of the lawyers that I know about why they're typically stressed out. And I think it goes without saying, there's a lot of work to be done with very little time. There's unreasonable expectations, fear of being wrong. And a lot of individuals who go to law school, go to med school are very type A and don't wanna be wrong. And you are constantly looking on the horizon for the next promotion, wanting to move up in the ladder. You never kind of feel truly settled, perhaps, even when you do make partner. Um, there's the fear of, I guess you can add fear of in front of all of these things, losing the argument and then fear of losing the argument, uh, malpractice fears, deadlines, unreasonable opponents, judges, partners, bosses. If you if you didn't marry a lawyer, then maybe the spouse is less understanding. If they didn't know you through law school, maybe a lack of family involvement, um, difficult to take vacations, work continues even though you're out. Uh, if you're like me, bring a little bit of your work home and do it on the couch and you really can't get away from, away from it all the time. <clears throat> And then these things take a toll day after day, year after year, and it's a it's a long term lifestyle. And I think some people have a, a revelation midway through their career that maybe or maybe even earlier than that, maybe they're in law school and they feel so deep into it that they just have to keep going through with it. And maybe they feel they're in the long the wrong profession, but feel stuck and can't get out of it. And that could be very tough to acknowledge when it's been something you wanted for your entire life. So all of those things probably contribute to um, delays in seeking treatment. If you have been delayed in seeking treatment, you're in very good company. Like as mentioned earlier, the majority of people with diagnosed, or not diagnosed, but who screen, would screen positive for a mental illness actually don't seek treatment. And the next majority of those individuals go to primary care doctors. So they don't go to psychiatrists or therapists, but I think the next biggest cohort is therapists. And then um, we see a very small percentage of those individuals. The median time to seeking treatment is 10 years. And I remember hearing that in med school and I, I looked up and I found the source and it is true. It is, it is quite long. It's just kind of astounding. But when you think about it, it's actually not that surprising um, because there's so many reasons that um, may not actually want to go to seek treatment. So among lawyers um, from that first study that I had referenced, it comes down to privacy. So privacy within within um, the doctor-patient setting and then also confidentiality and privacy outside of the doctor-patient setting. And that's the, the main reason among lawyers for not actually seeking treatment because um, our business depends on our reputation and we don't want other people to know that we're potentially um, seeking mental health treatment. And there's more, I'll talk more about that in the future. This is fairly small on my screen, but um, this, yeah, so like this is I I was just Google searching this and I found that this graph I, had, I thought it was pretty pretty nice and it had some added benefit of seeing how it changed from 2008 to 2018. Um, not being able to afford cost is the main main reason. Probably not the main reason for people in this audience, but um, couldn't they thought they could handle the problem without treatment and. Um, obviously, I understand confidentiality is an issue, but I want to be a little bit interactive with the audience. And if anyone wants to pop in some ideas in the chat box about why they or somebody else they they know, a friend or colleague had not sought treatment, um, feel free to pop it in the chat box. So as those are coming in, I, I'll just talk about... Um, so I, in my opinion, the main one of the main reasons is not thinking that your issue is bad enough. And that's why one of my slides later on is about how to recognize it being a problem. Um, so maybe you're like, oh, you know, I have to be suicidal to get tr get treatment. Um, or it's perhaps just intermittently bad. It's good for a couple of weeks, maybe um, you, get, you get a project done and you're, you know, um, make an effort to do more exercise, getting more sleep and things are better. Things are looking good, but then they're worse again. So now, you're like, oh, maybe maybe I should get treatment, but it's just intermittently bad. And that's, that's a pretty common reason. Um, people think that the situation is playing a role, perhaps. Um, so they'll blame it on themselves. And I have a slide coming up on the, on the situation. 
discouraged over difficulty in getting treatment scheduled. That's true. Calling a lot of people and then um, they don't answer the phone. <laughs> they don't call you back. They take the wrong insurance or they're scheduling three months out. Totally understand that one. Um, not sure what they would do. You don't know if medications could help. You prefer self-help. Um, you're worried about becoming stuck on a medication. Totally, that's a very valid, legitimate concern people have. They don't want to be that person who is taking psychiatric medication. They feel like they, they have reached a new point in their life where they're now on psych meds, so to speak. I have heard that so many times in a pejorative sense, I'm taking psych meds. Maybe because people feel that their lives are not objectively bad, so their bad feelings can't be too bad. In other words, people have it much worse. So why am I complaining? Yeah, totally. Totally. That's that's very true, especially if you have <clears throat> clients um, who are going through a divorce or going through some really bad situation. You might be in the back of your mind comparing yourself to them. Um, and then the last one down here, I would worried it would be reported and impact me in some unknown way. So in addressing stigma, I found this word cloud. It, it has all the good words that would probably be in a conversation about stigma. And, you know, despite all the resources out there, all the public education, all the pushes, the social media that we have nowadays, um, when it comes down to it, people really don't want to share. 46% um, of new partners said they'd be reluctant to tell their firms about mental health struggles. That was from a law.com article. Um, <clears throat> so like I mentioned, you know, we're, we make our business by our reputation. We want to put, put on this face, um, this presentation that we're well-spoken, we have it together. Um, and we're the image of that practice. So we want to make sure that we come across very professional, like we have no mental illness that could potentially impact our ability to serve you as a client. And I think that's that's probably what contributes to them not wanting to, to talk about it. I liked this quote from the um, New York State Bar Association. The idea that bravely and smartly addressing one's personal challenges early on could have a negative impact on admission to the bar is violative of our professional core values. Law firms and other employers of lawyers should encourage and support those who seek help for mental health or substance abuse issues, just as we would for uh, for those who are treated for physical health issues, such as heart trouble or cancer. People have no issues with disclosing to their, their boss that they're out for a, a bypass or they have cancer or maybe cancer. They probably won't say right away, but to their partners, they probably would say if they're going to go through treatment for cancer. But for mental health, they're seen as as weaker. <clears throat> so in addressing stigma, I think it's important to redefine what your idea of strong is. Like that quote from the New York State Bar Association mentioned, is, is being strong suffering in silence and having it affect your work? And um, or is, is being strong actually recognizing that you need help and getting it? Stigma in general, I think we, we contribute a little bit to stigma by our own internal judgments around mental health and people who seek mental health treatment. And so stigma, I think partially doesn't, it, it comes from internal self-judgments and perhaps internal resistance towards seeking treatment. <clears throat> the, there was an article that I found um, by Lawyers Concerned for Lawyers of Massachusetts. They recommended just starting small. So if you if you have a lot of stigma against seeking treatment, I would just start small by confiding in one individual, confiding in somebody you trust to start feeling unburdened by the turmoil that you're going through. And maybe you'll realize that other people actually have similar issues too. And if you own your story, you can start to feel like you're back in control. A lot of seeking treatment is a sense of feeling out of control. You can no, no longer control depression. You can't control anxiety or panic attack around people. Um, you want to feel like you're back in control. So if you start to own that story, maybe it does give you that sense. <clears throat> and, and in general, thinking about um, when you struggle with depression, anxiety, a lot of people, from my experiences, when I talk to patients and you ask them who they are and you ask deep questions about, about their essence of them, their their being, they they draw from the most challenging life experiences. Think about, for example, if you're ever interviewed by ABC or you're writing an autobiography or you're writing a personal statement, how are you going to define yourself? Well, you're going to probably talk about a story where you overcame a lot of adversity. So 
that that struggle and that working through that challenge in your life is actually part of your identity and who you are. And you can think about that and, and have it be something that you over, overcame rather than something that you struggled with. Um, and that can help with, with addressing stigma. There are, there are very real consequences to stigma. And that's why I think it was important enough to mention in this because it prevents people from wait or from getting treatment. They wait and wait and wait because there's so much resistance to getting treatment. They don't want to be perceived as being weak or flawed in the eyes of their partners or their clients. And so I couldn't tell you how many times I've heard from patients that they say they were at rock bottom. They were at rock bottom for this, rock bottom for that. And they were in a very dark place and um, barely functioning. And so I this was from the Florida Young Lawyers Division um, on their website. And it, was, it basically felt exactly like talking to a real patient because their story was was consistent with what I just said about having to wait so long to actually almost practically be forced to being to going to treatment because of being non-functional. So you don't need to tough it out. That's not the strong way to go. So just uh, think about and read read other individual stories. There's lots of ways to obtain treatment out there. Um, I'm sure everyone here is very well educated. Google is something you're totally familiar with, and there's lots of resources through the Lawyer Helpline, FLA, uh, Florida Lawyers Assistance Program. A lot of my patients use Psychology Today, uh, their insurance directory to see who's covered by your insurance plan. Google Maps, if you are more inclined to wanting an in-person treatment, uh, word of mouth if you talk to other individuals. Uh, there's even a text crisis line as well. So. And talking a little bit about uh, mental health and de depression, anxiety specifically. So from that that paper by List Token, um, so they, they pointed out the fact that um, most a lot of people say people in uh, lawyers in lar large law firms are more prone to mental illness. That's not actually supported by data, but what is supported is that women and young lawyers are have a higher prevalence of mental illness. Most common issues, I, in my experience, have been depression, anxiety, and sleep issues. Depression um, can mean a lot of different things. And we use that word loosely in the professional setting because it can mean low energy, could mean not being positive or not feeling any positivity. It could be frank tearfulness, although not in a lot of people. It could be feeling down, could be blue, empty, hopeless, dissatisfied, helpless, irritable, can have irritable depression, or you can just be not happy. So maybe when I say the word depression, you're like, oh, I'm not tearful. But in fact, I'm actually talking about <clears throat> all of these things all at once when I use that word. So clinically, it's defined as a period of two plus weeks, um, a period of two plus weeks with low mood, lack of enjoyment with certain number of other symptoms. So you have to have at least a certain number of symptoms and a constellation in that two plus weeks in order to fit the clinical criteria. But I, you know, it's not something I am like, oh, you only met four of the eight criteria rather than, rather than five. And you're actually, don't, you're not depressed. You know, it's something on a spectrum to me. And I, I, I use these clinical, these diagnoses that are in books and, and the screening as a supplemental tool. It's not, um, it's not a, a tell-all whether or not they fit the criteria. And if I'm going to treat them, it's a nice added um, information. Or is it mild, meat, moderate, or severe? Um, if I have a hard time judging that in an interview, but I'm, it's not. I, I take into consideration a lot of different input when making that call. And in regard to depression, something I always hear is, I'm just in a really tough spot in the situation. I'm in a, you know, trying to make partner. I have tons of um, deadlines coming up and uh, my wife's not happy. We've got some financial issues and, um, you know, it's all adding up. My bucket is full, so to speak. And maybe, it, you know, maybe it's not, maybe it's not you mentally, but it is the situation or maybe it's both, but, but really any situation can drive somebody to depression. Uh, there's probably 90, if you take a particularly tough situation, I'm sure 99% of people will feel clinically, all the symptoms of clinical depression in that scenario. So it's really not as, as, um, important of an argument as people make it out to seem. Um, 
you know, if it's not an argument against um, receiving treatment. So just just saying it's the situation doesn't necessarily absolve you from actually receiving treatment. You should take anything society has to offer you, even if even if there are um, options available to you in a tough situation. Why not Why not accept those options if if you're going to have a more enjoyable experience of that tough situation? Um, anxiety. So this uh, also can range quite a bit. So it could be fear of meetings, fear of court, fear of uh, public speaking. It could be jitters, tension, nausea, sweating, chest pain, impending doom. And individuals, it, for certain people, it could be just in particular situations. It could be performance related, like speaking, etc. Or it could be generalized where it's present in the morning, day, and at night when going to bed. And it could be predictable or unpredictable, and both of which have their own challenges. All of these characteristics affect what treatment recommendations I would make. So um, there's a variety of medications, and I'll, there's a slide I have coming up about meds. Uh, there's a variety of med options for anxiety specifically, and some of them are for a more daily use, and some are more for episodic or as-needed options. So, you know, there's it's not good to kind of lump all psychiatric meds in one bucket because they're they're very different. Uh, I want to give an overview of uh, all the types of uh, quote-unquote treatment. Some of these things I don't really necessarily consider them to be treatment, but nonetheless, these are things that real people tell me helps them. So I'm not going to discount that when these options help a lot of people. So from mildest to most, I would say, intense are self-help, various techniques, and I'll have a slide for each of these, nutrients, coaching, therapy, retreats, prescription meds, procedures, inpatient or intensive outpatient, partial hospitalization, and inpatient admission. <clears throat> so for self-help, there's obviously tons and tons of books, apps out there, biofeedback. Um, there's an alpha stim device, which has data to show that it now, that's the one that attaches to this woman's earlobes. That's called alpha stem. There's good data there to show that it, it treats anxiety and doesn't have a lot of the side effects from that medications carry. Um, there's the EEG biofeedback called Muse. That one, that's the top image there. These things I think are good for stress and overall wellness. I don't think they're very good first line treatments for serious mental illness. There are a lot of good techniques out there that have tons and tons of data. I wrote a grant um, for the VA to implement more exercise into their inpatient unit because I think they are so cooped up and these are veterans who are traditionally, you know, very active and they need to have some sort of way to exercise. I heard that a lot. So there's tons and data, tons of data there on my website. I have the, a lot of the resources and scientific research articles that support exercise for depression. There's mindfulness, journaling, all of these, which they accompany it. There's probably 10 to 50 apps for each of these things out there. Uh, that in and of itself can feel kind of overwhelming. Like where do you start? You can go with a reputable app though. Sleep even. Um, I, I actually do whole presentations on sleep and I'm just very quickly glossing over it, but it's really not to be discounted. The per you know, that's something I spend a significant amount of time on talking about with patients. I think it's a cause and symptom of mental health issues. Um, and it just is a foundation for positivity, for focus and concentration, and very much needed in your life to get good sleep. You can focus on relationship issues. There's a whole subset of therapy um, called interpersonal therapy that looks at just at relationships alone. There's something uh, like a light box that's good for seasonal affective disorder, which is that little lap laptop looking screen that's propped up on the desk there. And these apps, this is Insight Timer, Headspace, 10% Happier, Calm, Oak, and Waking Up by Sam Harris. And there's a bunch of journaling apps too out there. In terms of nutrients, um, one really good website that I like is called examine.com. And it compiles all the PubMed scientific research articles in one very easy to read table. 
that has that, that you can search by name of the nutrient and figure out what evidence is out there to support it helping with fatigue versus energy, focus, depression, anxiety. So here I just kind of plopped down some names of um, a few that I hear very often. And um, Sam E and l methylfolate and EPA actually have a lot of good data um, to support them for treating depression specifically. Um, anxiety, there's ashwagandha, valerian, and I think there's more data for those two than there is for holy basil or rhodiola. Uh, there's some options for sleep, um, general probiotics, um, specific strains, Helveticus, uh, the Shirota strain of Cassia and Gasseri um, probiotics are are very helpful for mental health. There's um, studies on that. The Health Med trial showed that the Mediterranean diet could be good for mental health. And then there's there's just tons of other vitamins, and nutrients, and herbal that that that's not really my my background, but I always resort to examine.com. And if these things help for some people, I don't argue with that. That's, that's great. You know, if saffron, you know, Dr. Amen really pushes saffron. Um, I don't typically suggest that as like a first line thing that I use, but if somebody says saffron really helped them through a tough time in their life, I, I say, that's, that's really great. Let's keep you on saffron. So everybody has a individual response to some of those nutrients. There's the whole coaching industry. Maybe, um, you know, coaching compared to therapy feels like very supportive. Um, and maybe they're more approachable and they take a more holistic, um, comprehensive look at you and your business. And maybe some people like that. And so I can see why certain people are attracted to going to a coach versus therapy. But the coaches are not trained therapists. They don't recognize mental health issues. And OCD, ADHD, and maybe another diagnosis can be masquerading as anxiety and you think it's manifesting as anxiety, you go see a coach, but maybe you have underlying um, ADHD or OCD. So that's one drawback to seeing a coach. Some people say they're more future oriented, more related to uh, problem solving, um, but some would disagree with that. But um, there are retreats. I know patients who go on retreats. Uh, I don't know anything really about them other than they, to me, they seem like a very expensive vacation with a mental health focus. There's the um, Ayurveda retreats. There's healing arts, community circles, expressive dance, sound healing, um, where you can harness empathy, compassion, and resilience. Um, I'll take a little break to look at the chat box. And if anybody has any feedback on retreats and all ears would love to hear you know i i love getting information from other patients and giving that to other patients so i i love hearing feedback from other people telling other people what worked for them i think maybe 10 years ago i wouldn't even have a slide on nutrients but i have so many people who say these nutrients help them so you know i think it's important to talk about i think many people many who say stigma actually don't believe therapy will make their life better that's true yeah they can maybe downplay the, the role of therapy. So I guess nobody in the, the audience has gone on a retreat or don't speak too highly about retreats, perhaps. <laughs> I would love to check out a retreat, to be honest with you. I, I'm really kind of curious to see what happens. I see them on the, in the media. All right, so going into therapy, um, there's a wide variety of therapists out there. They all have different backgrounds, different education. They take a different approach to looking at you. There's licensed professional counselors, clinical social workers who kind of know about community resources a little bit better. There's marriage and family therapists who might talk about their relationship issues, marriage, focus on the family unit. Um, there's individuals who have PhD in clinical psychology, and there's another doctorate called the PsyD. Um, there's individual versus group therapy. And for this audience, it's probably more keen on um, reducing or pre preventing um, or promoting confidentiality. I think obviously more people probably lean towards individual, but group can be very helpful in understanding what other people are going through. There's a sense of camaraderie and togetherness and unity that that you don't get an individual therapy. I used to run groups for three years or so, both in person and virtually. I'm really a big fan of groups. Um, if it doesn't work, just like you would approach 
medications. If a med didn't work, I don't say all meds are bad. You say, okay, let's think about this mechanism of action for this medication. Maybe try a different one that's more suited for you. Same thing with therapy. Because of the therapists have so many different backgrounds, just try a different therapists. I know your time's limited, but um, give it another chance. Um, somebody else might have a different approach. The The process of therapy, I think, is what really puts it light years ahead of just regular self-help book, knowing the concepts of CBT versus actually doing them with somebody in a conversation are two totally different things. So in therapy, you would self-assess, you would come up with a concept, you would then express it to somebody, figure out how to best express it. You see another person react to that, you reflect on their reaction, you reevaluate your original thought, you identify together any sort of flawed patterns of thinking, obviously with more trust that you've built with the therapist. You um, should ideally feel a sense of unconditional positive regard from the therapist, which is something that perhaps a lot of people in this room have an experience when, when growing up. It's a very unique experience that um, is unique to therapy, the sense of unconditional positive regard. And that maybe sometimes even makes people feel a little bit uncomfortable at times because they're not used to that. But it's just overall sense of support where you can go to a safe place and be yourself and talk about anything bothering you with a therapist. And then there are prescription medications, which um, have been around for a very long time, uh, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, which are um, antidepressants and anti-anxiety meds, their first line treatment for anxiety. They're very safe. Um, the, there are some there's side effects to them. Uh, the most common ones are are GI upset, sexual side effects, and in session I talk a lot about the nuances to those things. So it's um, would be a disservice to say the take home point is that all SSRIs have GI symptoms. There's, it's a lot. It's a little bit more complicated than that. Um, but one of the main concerns about starting meds is people feel stuck on them, and I hear that a lot. Um, being stuck in the physiologic sense is not common unless it's with Effexor and Paxil. There are ways to slowly come down on them and off them, but you're not dependent on them for the rest of your life. You're not stuck on them for the rest of your life. That's not how they work. That's not what my experience is with them. Um, they don't change your personality. You're not going to be a zombie. Uh, the most common phrase that I hear people use to describe them is that it's easier to deal with certain things and just move on. Like they're, it doesn't grind their gears as much. They don't, certain stressors don't get a huge rise out of them as much, but you may still have the th the thoughts there, the um, anxious thoughts, but they don't cause you to get locked up. Um, you can just move on more easily. Um, the side effect of being emotionless and foggy, I think is very multifactorial, needs to be examined further um, for why that individual is experiencing that. Uh, the most common question I get is when when is it going to help me? Well, it's like walking up a a gradual hill and asking yourself, "Am I at the top of it yet?" When you're when you're blindfolded, you don't really know. Um, have you gotten the full benefit from it yet? And they say you have to be on it for six weeks to to make a a judgment about the medication and its helpfulness. But that's not to say you might feel some benefit in two weeks, three weeks. I've had people um, numerous times say they noticed a benefit immediately. Uh, right away. And um, that's uncommon, but definitely happens enough that makes me feel that that's real. Um, so, you know, when somebody comes to me, they might be afraid I'm, I'm going to recommend something and otherwise I couldn't see them. I have a lot of patients who I, I see and we don't start meds until the third, the fourth. I have one person who actually I've been seeing for probably eight months now, and he hasn't started meds. I prescribed some, but he's never felt comfortable starting with them. And I've seen him maybe 15 times now. We talk about med options. He's very skittish about starting meds. And it doesn't mean I can't see a patient if they don't want to take the medication. We talk about it and do kind of shorter abbreviated therapy sessions in the appointment. Um, and I talk to them about what they're, what they're interested in, what their concerns are. Um, and it's a, it's a two-way conversation. Like I mentioned, um, I, I kind of grinds my gears when somebody says um, I need psych meds or psych meds don't help me or psych meds hurt my uncle. You know, we don't do that with like ibuprofen and fentanyl and all medication 
medical meds, um, but for some reason, psychiatric meds are of this reputation that they're all the same. Uh, there's a lot of procedures out there that could be useful for treating depression. TMS is a magnet that sits on the prefrontal cortex, um, basically your upper left forehead, and it's magnetic stimulation. Changing magnetic field induces a, a small depolarization in that area that's um, hypoactive in the brain. And over time, many repeated sessions that can help stimulate that area of the brain. It's not a first-line treatment. It's very time-consuming. Probably many people in this audience are not too, too keen on because it is time-consuming. There's ECT. If somebody has treatment-resistant depression, they've tried multiple meds. ECT is a gold standard in effectiveness. Obviously, uh, that movie, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, did a number of damage to ECT. Um, and I feel like we're still undoing that damage because a lot of people feel like it's just uh, uh, just a way too spooky to, to go and do ECT. But it's actually the best hands-down form of treatment for depression and bipolar and psychosis, actually. It's like a small outpatient surgery where you go under anesthesia for about two minutes, come out of anesthesia, get driven home, do that three days a week. And um, it may take 10 sessions or so to start to feel benefit, but it is very effective. And that reminds me of one thing I wanted to say about therapy. If you're not responding to therapy, you know, give it some time. And uh, a lot of the data when they look at therapy versus meds or therapy versus placebo, you could do placebo therapy. In fact, um, the, the, it separates from placebo. The effect separates from placebo after a few weeks. So it's not in the first session that you're going to feel uh, happy after therapy. So just keep that in mind. Um, there's ketamine. Uh, these things are getting so much press lately. Um, ketamine is not as effective as ECT, but um, can have some quicker response to depression. Um, it's now covered by insurance because there's that intranasal one, Spravato, um, that they showed benefit. So you can get ketamine either IV, you can get it intranasally, um, you can get it as a troche, like a sublingual. So there's a lot of different ways to administer ketamine. Ketamine and psilocybin are usually in combination with what's called um, uh, uh, psychedelic assisted therapy, where it has different varieties of what that looks like, but it's usually under the supervision of a therapist. And other startups that basically the supervision is through a phone, so and they deliver the psychedelics to you at home. Uh, so this, the field is changing very, very quickly, and I have a hard time keeping up with it, hence the podcast. Um, MDMA is actually expected to be legalized next year due to a huge landmark phase three trial that showed a very, very substantial improvement in treating PTSD. It was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. Um, I think it was around 100 subjects in the PTSD arm. And um, that was one of the primary reasons that's getting pushed through. There is intensive outpatient um, where you are going to a facility or it's virtual four to five days a week, three to four hours a day for group therapy. And then you have a, an hour or two of individual and or family therapy. So this is for individuals who need more regular therapy um, don't want to take time off from work and don't want to be going to a retreat or a residential center. And maybe they need more frequent med changes. So they have this in-between option called IOP. And this is um, typically geared towards substance use treatment, but there are mood disorder programs as, as well that are just for mood disorders. The next step above that is called partial hospitalization. It's a little bit more time intensive. It's for individuals who have a higher likelihood of relapse without daily support. They have a, maybe an unsupportive home environment that needs a little bit more work. They have emotional and cognitive needs that are very severe. Um, however, there is no safety concerns that would merit inpatient hospitalization. That's that's the option and last resort when um, I think of treatment because it's the most restrictive form of treatment. It's for individuals who have acute thoughts of a plan of self-harm. Um, and maybe possible withdrawal symptoms. So there's something about their health that is of concern. Uh, <clears throat> they might have severe emotional and behavioral cognitive issues. They have poor engagement with treatment, therefore need a very structured program. I mentioned um, alcohol use is very common for um, young lawyers. Uh, lawyers at private law firms report problematic drinking at rates of 50% greater than their counterparts in-house or with the government. 
So young mm -hmm. lawyers, um, even you know, women are actually more likely that, than their women counterparts to their other non-lawyer women counterparts to drink alcohol too. So think of, of young individuals who work in private law. Um, you know, when I talk about alcohol, um, obviously there's some genetic component to it on par of, on the rate of 60 to 70 percent hetero um heritability and you want to think about where it came from is i mean if it wasn't common in your family are you self-medicating for anxiety certain insecurities depression and in that instance it comes together with other mental health issues so in as an addiction psychiatrist i'm always thinking you know they have it they have a substance issue, but let's also look at the whole person and see what else is going on. Um, there's no like true cutoff. Uh, I mentioned earlier five, five plus drinks, 12 plus days a year for considered heavy drinking. But, you know, I think of more when I'm assessing somebody functional change. And I know in the back of my mind, work is like the last thing to be affected. They, they want to protect that at all costs. That's like their baby. Uh, that's how they make a living. They put food on their table by going to work. So, um, you know, when, if you see some issues with somebody at work, they, it's probably um, much worse than what you what, what they're letting on because you're seeing them at their best usually at, at work. So it's, um, they might have a take a hit with certain roles at home, their health, uh, other relationships. There are screening forms that obviously I take into consideration one small part. Um, one thing I want to mention to a group of lawyers is that um, when I'm assessing functional change, a 1% impact on a professional can be very significant. So you can't compare yourself to a friend who, if they're not in law. So, you know, being late to meetings, you're not following through with briefs, uh, forgetful, drifting off, not feeling present, disorganized. Uh, dreading waking up, being more irritable. These are kind of things I would look out for. It could be a slow and insidious onset, making it difficult to recognize when it's a problem because it didn't, it wasn't a problem at first. And that requires a conversation with somebody like myself or another professional to recognize it. Is this a problem? Um, don't be afraid of IOP PHP programs. They're a great way to jumpstart sobriety, build a community. You get to learn, meet other lawyers who have the same struggles. Uh, you could take time off and reset, uh, you, you know, and just build a little bit of sobriety under your belt before going back to work and start starting off strong again. The group meetings probably make a lot of people feel a little nervous being vulnerable in a group setting because that's not a common feeling. Um, but there's, it's actually a lot of data there for that. There's a few FDA approved medications as well um, for alcohol. As, and I use some of the non FDA approved meds for alcohol too. So, in wrapping up, we've got um, one, two, maybe, it's, yeah, two slides left. So, treatment starts with you. Recognize your own bias. It could be whatever you want it to be. Obviously, I went through the whole gamut of options. Um, it needs to be addressed directly. Um, Find other mentors, other lawyers who have balance, who have their life together, try to emulate them, copy them, ask their secret, ask them for help, discover their systems. Um, surround yourself with positive people, supportive people, family, therapists, friends, stray away from negativity, uh, take pride in your profession. You represent people, even if the client's a corporation, and the, the client is a person, not a file. And by humanizing your work, I think it can lead to more gratification, sense of fulfillment, rather than just thinking you're working for a large law firm. Um, join groups professionally and socially. You need a sense of belonging. Uh, there's a lot of people out there with values and interests just like yours. So struggling in isolation is very overwhelming. And even if none of this stuff applied to you, I think we owe it to our colleagues to be compassionate, understanding, promote awareness, and foster supportive environment towards mental wellness and others.